Okay, so my name is Andre. I am an engineer at NVIDIA. I'm working in synthetic data, data generation in the Isaac team. I started since last year and I've been work, mostly working on tutorials and connecting Replicator with uh, Isaac Sim. Um, for today, I was thinking that we can go over the main tutorials documentation on the OV replicator side and on the Isaac Sim side. Then we can um, look over some workflows on how to generate data, look over some um, uh, issues that most users have from the forums and maybe explain the workflow better so it's clearer and go over some examples with this and look over the current limitations and workarounds for, for that. Um, yes, for if you guys have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat. I will try to keep this in mind. And depending on uh, the question, I will either try to answer it directly or if it's related of of the current examples, then we can directly talk about them. Uh, otherwise, at the end, I hope there's going to be time to basically go over all the questions and make them clearer. Whatever we cannot or I do not know the answers for, please just write them in the forum, tag them accordingly, and we will go over them. And then we can also try to delegate this to the right persons who might know the answers. Um, OK, so then let's get started, maybe going over uh, the documentation. So for synthetic data generation, um, Omniverse has this extension called Replicator. And it basically provides a means to collect data for learning. It can randomize objects in the scene and uh, use various annotators to collect uh, various data, and it provides writers how to write this data to either disk or in the cloud. Um, OK, so basically, the core component is uh, the semantic schema editor. So it's important to annotate things in your scene. So basically, you label them with their classes. This also shows up sometimes in the forum that users don't get data, and it happens that it because the scene is not annotated. Um, I can try to show an example how this should look like. So here I have Isaac Simo opened, and by selecting an annotator we want to see. So for example, instance segmentation, which requires the scene to scene to be labeled. Um, we can see the AOV in action, basically. For every, every prim, you would have a different color a segmentation mask. Um, in case you have not labeled your scene, it would look something like, so let's create a cube. And then if we show semantic segmentation, You do not get anything. And then if we would label them, it appears. So this is a, a UI for helping on labeling scenarios. We will go over this a bit later if it makes sense. But basically what happened that this prim now has a property with a semantic. Let me see if I can see it here. If not, then we can see it in the editor. And if we click on it, it will say class cube. Um, OK. Moving on. Then we also have the visualizer. So this is what we just saw here. So this button here of the sensors, where you can choose the various annotators, what you want to visualize. So you can visualize color depth and then depth are two types either distance to the camera or to the focal point and or to the image plane i think it we can also go to more details 
um, here. There's a nice documentation. We look over tutorials and annotator information. So here it can it goes over all these annotators, and it also provides extra data and demos on how to run them and what to expect the output data to look like. So for color, you would get the channels and what type of data it will come out. So I think this is also important to keep in mind. Um, this has been recently added, and I think not every user know about knows about this. Um, so whenever I don't know, you get some data from an annotator and you don't know what shape or type it is, you can look over this and it should provide all the information. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, something to keep in mind, the replicator uses OmniGraph to generate this. So we had a... Um, I think um, many users didn't uh, did not really understand the workflow of how this happens. So basically, uh, Replicator has these Python scripts, and these scripts generate a graph, which will then collect the data. Um, yes, we will also go over those with examples, and I'll try to show them live how it they appear. Maybe it makes it clearer. Then what else we had here? Um, Okay, so from replicator side, I think this would be it. Uh, and then we have the Isaac sim side, so Isaac replicator. This basically builds on top of the replicator extension, and it has various uh, example tutorials, which makes sense more in the simulation part, and also various UIs like helper functions or extensions built on top of replicator, for example, to annotate the data. As I mentioned, it's important to have your scene labeled. Um, this UI helps you to automatically select either prims and then click add, and it will label them given some rules. Or you can quickly annotate your whole scene using the prim names. Um, I think it makes sense to look over it. Um, and we also have some example snippets in case you want some custom rules. So basically, it just gives an example of how you can traverse your, your stage and uh, apply various rules on your scene to, to label it. Then we have the visualizer as we went over them. Um, and the recorder. So the recorder uses a writer from Replicator. It wraps it as an extension. And then in this UI, you can select various cameras, the AOVs you want to output, the number of frames, and it will basically, on play, it will generate uh, the images in the folder you would like to. So this is a useful tool for quickly debugging on how the data looks like or testing how it would look like as, a, as an end product, so to say. So using the basic writer, it has all the standard annotators that are here with their various parameters. So for example, for semantic segmentation, you can set it as colorized, true or false. Um, this again is documented here. So it makes sense looking over it once you get stuck. Um, Yes, from Isaac's theme side, I think this would be it. We can uh, maybe go over some basic examples. Let me open this previous scene again. So this might take a while since it's large. And I will try to show you the difference between um, using a parameter called colorize for the semantic segmentation. So we had some questions where users were, think, uh, were thinking that there's the sin is not semantically labeled because everything looked black, but it's basically just different types of grayscales that you cannot see with your 
uh, naked eye. So you actually, you would have like almost black and a bit of lighter black and so on and so forth. And this happens when um, you don't select colorize for it. So let's see where it is. Okay, semantic segmentation. So you have two types of up, uh, output formats. So normally, you would, if you select colorize, it will give you an RGB uh, A channel uh, image with colors. And otherwise, it will give you a 2D array of UINT32, so only one channel. And not all editors can really read this. Um, image that it can tell you it has different colors it will try to read it as rgba and it will tell you that they're all the same color however if you load it correctly you will see that all of them has different values uh, so let's try this out so for this i will go to the semantic data recorder i will choose semantic segmentation as output and tell it to colorize it and just to take one snapshot. Okay, and then we can open this. Okay, here it is. And then we can see the image in color and also the various labels that we see there. So we can see the RGB value, RGBA value for the given class and so on and so forth. Um, if we now select, well, we don't tell it to colorize it, and we do another snapshot, we will get this in grayscale. And if you normally open it, you would think everything is black and it's not working. However, once we look into the labels, All right, there we go. You will just see that there basically each color just gets a value like zero. It's from grayscale, like black, and then the largest one would be white. And then you get for each class an increment like zero is background, two is the lamp, three is the box, and so forth. And we can check this, for example, if we open this with, uh, for example, Krita and use a color picker then you can actually see the various colors. Hopefully it doesn't take too long to load. No, it's fine. So we have your color picker. And then you see the gray value like 6, 24, 17, and so forth. So the data is there. Um, yes, OK, this is what I wanted to go over with the colorized part. Let's see on my list what else. It's not that I forget things. OK, another important thing, or important in case you run into some issues. So the RT subframes. Basically, this renders a frame multiple times. So in case uh, you are teleporting objects, the rendering might leave the shadows behind. So it might need multiple steps to actually um, get rid of that shadow, so to recalculate the lighting. And uh, especially in Replicator, so you, since you're teleporting a lot of things, it might make sense if you get these issues to play with these values. So this depends a lot on your lightning. If you have very strong lightning, you won't need so many. But if it's like very, very dark, you might need multiple subframes. Uh, this basically will slow down your data generation with the number of frames you give. You give. Um, and there's also this is also documented. We can look over that here. So with if you go over rendering with subframes, it will nicely explain it to you. So you can see also for materials if they're not loading. So you have these artifacts. You might need want to add more subframes. 
so it will then render more frames that will only save the last one the one that you give um yes and there's not really a rule how much you can what value you should use that's why you should for each scenario play with these values and try them out and that's why it's useful to have like this ui then you can quickly play with this value save an image if it looks good then you know you can then put this in a script and start collecting data hmm. okay then let's go over some snippets and then try to see how the, the graphs are being generated okay so script editor here uh, this is a, a nice extension that you can basically run Python snippets and you can quickly see the result in in a replicator um, this is useful for prototyping so if you want to test randomizers and so on and so forth you can like try out here smaller snippets and then before having your final script you can then test your values like in which between which values to randomize things what materials to use and once you're happy with them you can then know you can use that graph in the final script um, so I saved some examples and then we can go over them one by one so for example here we're going to create a cube and we're going to trigger on each frame to randomize the, the this cube between these two distributions um what i noticed that uh a lot of users think that actually this on trigger on frame will run here in the loop on every frame but actually this script just generates a graph which will then run when you hit play uh, so this only runs once i added this print function here so we can see this so if we now like run control enter or click here it should generate the graph so it will it spawn this cube in the scene which we see here it created a new scope added a transform and the cube and it also generated this uh, graph so in this graph we then see the nodes of the graph you can also visualize this this is a simple one but once you have a complicated script it's not really made i know open graph there we go so then we can see here the nodes how they're connected so this will basically create nodes and connect them and once you hit play it will execute this and here it will be run on frame uh like this node will run on frame multiple times and not the print st statement and the nodes that are created here we can go over them so one node is for example the transform of the cube another one is the actual cube the mesh then we have here on frame it checks interval one because we didn't give any values here so it will run every frame the number of frames zero so that means it will run forever and the number of subframes which we also did not select so these are the default values this is what you can add here as arguments on on frame uh, and then it will output the current frame and so on and so forth and the output will go to the other node um, I cannot go into details with all this Omnigraph. This is also documented on another part, so it's not really the scope of this uh, stream, and I'm also not the expert on it to um, give this. So here is also the sampler, so the randomizer. You see the, the bounds, so we told them to randomize between 111 and 222, and it will return the value between these. Um, yeah so basically these are the node you can see how i select them gets them here selected and uh, you see when we generated it actually wrote here that we executed this but we're not really randomizing the cube for this we can either run 
orchestrator step or run, or we can just do this also from here. It does the same thing. So preview will actually load the graph once. And if we step, it will randomize it once. And if we put resume to run, it will basically randomize between these two poses for indefinitely. Okay, let's stop this. Create a new stage. Um, let me check for any questions. Okay, something with LiDAR, I might leave that to the end. Um, so I think Replicator doesn't have a, an annotator for LiDAR per se, um, but it should have in the near future. Okay, so then I guess we can move on to the next one. In most of the examples that you see on, on the replicator extension, <clears throat> sorry, um, you see these things with rep new layer. So uh, this is not really needed. It will still run without this. This is more like if you don't want to uh, apply the changes that replicator does to your exec existing layer, you might you create a new one, and then all the changes, everything that you spawn in this uh, indentation, it will basically happen um, on a separate layer. So here we have a sphere, we create a sphere and a cone, which is going to be in our layer, and then we create a new one, and all the changes of this are going to happen then in the new layer. So we can also try this out. So we have the cube sphere and cone. Um, here in stage, you seal them everything in the same scope. But if we go to the layer tab, um, we see that an anonymous layer has been created. And um, for example, the cone, the sphere, and the cube. I oh, know cube is here um this is probably a reference I'm not sure what this is or that i moved it uh it's created in an anonymous layer so that means that whatever you you randomize there or you change materials and so forth it's just going to happen in a separate layer and then you can undo that um this might be is problematic sometimes with isaac sim this should be fixed also in the future uh, when the two are basically working in different layers, there are some parts of Isaac Sim that would like to access things in different layer and that doesn't work correctly. And the other way around, where Replicator will try to uh, access something on a different layer, which is in the simulator, and it also has some issues. So best when using both together for now is to avoid creating a new layer and to make sure you don't overwrite anything on your current stage either work on a copy when working with Replicator, or just when you quit, don't save, save the stage, and then the changes are not going to be applied. Um, yes, maybe I can run the other script again. So we can see that there's no anonymous layer created. So here, we only have the root layer. Um, another useful function that has been recently added is premat path. So get premat path. Uh, this is useful in case you do not load your your uh, meshes or scenarios using replicator, and you maybe have already an existing um, scenario, or you created using USD API or Isaac Sim API. But then you want to um, basically get that prim and randomize it. You do not want to create a new one. Uh, so exactly, this is important when when creating. Well, I'm going to go back to this example again, to the first one. When you create a cube or a mesh in Replicator, this is not actually a prim. 
So this is a prim wrapped in a node, which is going to be then forwarded in the action graph. So this could be one prim or a list of prims. Um, that's why you cannot really use the all the API that you are familiar from USD to apply it on this part. And that's why then it's useful knowing of this other function, because then you can actually use the prims, existing prims at the path, and then wrap them in a node using get prim at path. This accepts also one um, path to the prim or a list. So it will either wrap one or a multiple node. And then you can use this node to further apply either trigger or change materials and so on and so forth. So in this case, we have a cone and a cube, which are not in the in the world yet, but we can still generate the graph. And now we see that we also have a node here. And this node has as input these two paths. So see, it didn't complain, even though if this don't exist yet, because we didn't actually run the graph yet. We just generated it and when it's going to run it will search for these two meshes so right now we're going to like create a cone and a cube and then they're in this predefined path that i added before and then let's create another cylinder and then run replicator so preview basically runs the the no this the graph once it doesn't save the data and then if I step this, it will basically randomize these two meshes. Um, let me quickly check the chat if there's anything. Okay, there's a question if it's essential labeling 3D models with real world information. This is not necessary. So basically you can label it however you want it. Just at the end, you need to know the mapping of color to the label. So. You can also add numbers. You can also add classes. You can also add multiple classes. Um, so this is also, I think, documented somewhere where, where how are all the rules? Because you can have like nested prims and then depending on which annotator you use and which, which properties, it will basically append all the classes together. So if you have like, I don't know, a uh, car and wheel, and then you want to, to label the whole car, then it will get car. But if you get only want the wheel, it will tell you the car and the wheel. You can also apply labels on materials. And so that will be then spread on every prim that has this material. So there are multiple combinations on how to do this. And it's it should also be documented. I'm not sure exactly where, but um, yeah, I can look at that up at the end if it's if there's still time. Um, okay, let me. Uh, okay, so another current limitation is uh, between Replicator and Isaac Sim. So since one is working with OmniGraph and it's bound uh, to the timeline of running this randomization and collecting the data, um the simulator also does this so right now there's some limitation in case you want to use events that are happening in the simulator and then collect the data so this is that we're gonna uh, work on for the new release to make this uh more flexible between the two worlds uh right now there's a workaround for this that we can go over um yeah so for this I will close Isaac Sim and go over the examples. So I will use a simulation app. So basically I'm gonna run Isaac Sim as an application. And this will give us total control on stepping in the simulator and also in the whole application. Um, so this is an example for that. You import the simulation app um, then you give it configuration so you want it to run headless or not we said it that we want to see things and what type of lighting so there's a lot of parameters that you can choose it's basically how you want to start 
the the whole um, application. What's very important is that you should import all the modules after you run the application. Otherwise, you're going to get errors or you're not going to get errors and things are not going to work. So it's important that these are important after you start a simulation. This is something that I added so I can quickly just close the application. So here I told it to run in a, an endless loop. Normally, it will stop after the simulation ends, but now I just wanted to like tinker around with it. So I let it up, uh, run forever. That's why I added this handler. Whenever I press Control C, this is going to get triggered, and it's just going to close the application. So let's try to run this. So right now, it's not doing anything. It's going to create a world, uh, an Isaac Sim world, and add a plane. And then reset sets up all the uh, physics parts for it. So let's run it with Python and with Evans and the long examples. So it's basically starting the simulation. Let's hope all goes well. I'm going to check the chat on that. So you can definitely have large areas and then randomize over it. So basically, this is what the simulation app looks like as a standalone application. As it runs in the loop, so it updates the whole application. I can actually run it as Isaac Sim, create meshes, and so forth. Of course, it has other limitations because it's not the same thing. You don't have. Uh, so everything runs basically in this loop. So you cannot just add dynamically things to it, probably. Um, yes, yeah, so what we're going to try is to have a simulation where boxes are going are gonna to fall to the floor. And every time a box falls, it will check, uh, basically compare the, the velocity. And once the velocity is almost 0, it will trigger to capture an image. So this is problematic if we're using the built-in riders from Replicator, because these riders are being triggered um, every step in the timeline. So every time we want to step the simulation, it also triggers a data acquisition. So this should be fine if you're like running randomization every frame and you want to collect every frame. But in case you want to simulate something and you, don't know, you do not know when uh, an event is going to occur in the future, and that's when you want to take the image, then it's problematic. So a current workaround for this now is to um, access that data directly from the annotator. So what the writer does, it maybe we can look over it. So this is the, uh, the basic writer that Replicator use, and it takes the inputs, all the annotators, so this is very similar to the UI that I showed because it just built on top of this. And um, yeah, then afterwards it writes the data. There's a write function. It just iterates over all the annotators uh, for annotators in the data. And then it, if it's RGB, then writes it as RGB and so on and so forth. So what we can do, we can access directly this data and then write it ourselves. And this way we get uh, control on when we want to access the data, and it's not going to be written every frame. Um, 
Yes, okay, so for this, I, I will basically just add things to this. So in the second version, what I added is that I create um, five cubes, or it's basically cuboids, that means dynamic cuboids, it has also physics on top of it and collision, so it's gonna fall once we run the simulation, and we position them at the height 10, and for every each cube, like one value higher. Then we simulate the cube for like 10,000 frames. However, we stop this simulation if the velocity of the cube um, is smaller than 0, 0,1. Um, okay, so then again, we run this endlessly. So let's see if this runs well. We'll check. Okay, so we can see the cubes falling. And we have also the data that cube zero stopped after 83 simulation steps, 87, 89. So you can see it's not really a repeating action that you can say, create a graph and say, okay, save the image either every 10th frame or every five second, because this event might happen at different timestamps. So, yeah, let's try to collect the data using a writer. So this is the third version. What I added here is uh, we get the basic writer from the register. So this is also on the replicator web page. There's a lot of examples of this. It's not worth going over all of them. If somebody's not familiar with it, you can go over the tutorials and all of them have examples and then you can quickly test them and uh, understand them. It also shows you how to write the custom writers, how to use the annotators. Uh, I will just go over some some like workarounds for current limitations that are norm very often asked in the forum. Um, let me go back to Isaac Sim. Oh, no. Here we go. So okay, I, I just use this standard way of getting the, the writer. I set an output directory and I initialize it. When you initialize it, you basically, from the list of annotators, you can choose which one you want and what, what arguments. So we only want the RGB right now. Um, then we create a camera using replicator at a given position and we tell it to look at the center. Uh, what's important, we can then create a render product. So this is what actually generates uh, the rendering. So not the camera is just the location. So here you tell it which camera and with what resolution. And then we attach this to the writer. So the writer will get data from this render product, which will then be initialized with this RGB annotator. Then we can create the cubes. And here I added a step function. So basically that means whenever a cube stopped moving is to trigger this replicator step that we until now did manually in the um, UI. And this should then call, uh, save one step of the data. However, it, it will interfere also with the world step, which also steps um, the simulation one step forward. So that means every time um, Isaac Sim simulates uh, the environment, it will automatically trigger replicator as well. I have to log in again. One minute. There's a question if we can use replicator to change the physics properties of objects such as rigidity. 
Uh, so you can definitely change its uh, properties. I'm not sure if rigidity is uh, a property. Um, uh, we can go over the physics. So you see here that basically it interfered with uh, the simulation. One cube fell down, and once you hit step, it's just basically the rest didn't. However, it did route row those data or should have, yes. And uh, yeah, we see that it's basically started to save every frame. And then at step, it stopped. So the cube is there, but it saves all the data. Um, so the workaround for this is we have um, like a helper function that just saves the images that saves it to, to file. So one can either write its own. Uh, this is the disadvantage of this. You cannot use the write-in, the built-in writers that takes care of this for your, for you. You have to write this on your own. You can also just go to the basic writer into the write function and see how these are written. So there's a, you can then basically reuse the backend writer for your directly here in the annotator. <clears throat> um, OK, so instead of getting the writer, we now just get the annotator. So we create an annotator of type RGB, and then we attach this to our render product, which has the same resolution. And this is using the same camera that we create here. Uh, and then if we attach it to the to the um, annotator, it will basically be filled with data every step. However, we can access this data using get data directly on the annotator. Um, so here we commented out the orchestrator step function. We don't need this anymore because world step will do that uh, from our side. And then we will just get the data whenever we want. So in this case is when the cube stopped, we get the data and we save it to file. So now if we run this, version four, Okay, so I can until then search the physics. Uh, use physics with replicator. So it's also here. So you can change the standard values. So you can set a, a, an object that's rigid body. So normally you would have um, in replicator without collisions or rigid bodies, all everything that you spawn, and then they will move around and take images. However, you can also run simple simulation using replicator so for this you would want to set this as rigid bodies and you can also then apply velocities and simulate it for a few seconds and then take the image so if it's a very repeating scenario that you know i know you're dropping something and it will fall down every three seconds then you can always randomize drop them wait three seconds and uh, then take the snapshot. So for this case, you can do everything in Replicator. And this is also documented here on how you can do this. So you see here, you can also trigger not on frame, but on time. And this is for every two seconds and to stop after 10 frames. Um, yeah, I think there are enough tutorials to actually see how, how you can simulate things. So let's see for. OK, yeah, so this started. The boxes fell down. And let's see if we have data. OK, so that uh, looks good. So we have for the first cube at step 83. This is how it looks like. Second cube, step 87. This is how it looks like. Third, fourth, and then basically they fell down. Um, so yeah, this is the current workaround for this. This should allow you to run then any kind of simulator that you can run in Isaac Sim and to also collect data without interfere with the simulator. Uh, the same thing can also run as a 
extension so it doesn't have to be a standalone app you can also like create a button and whenever you click it you will have access to the data i don't have an example right now about this i will also add this uh, snippet that i added here to uh, to the isaac sim frequently to frequently used python snippets and it will probably be next to multi camera this is also a very similar example which uses a custom writer and also annotator to write data data it will be but however it raised, uh, writes it every frame and it doesn't really have a simulation inside so to extend in this i will add also this uh example that i have now to the documentation and hopefully by next week it's going to be here and then uh, one can then build up on top of this okay let me check any more answers so i think from my side this would be it let me check if i forgot anything on my agenda no i think that looks good and then i can look over questions now or if you have any other questions feel free to write them So there's a question if the mass can be varied, I think. I do not know for sure. Um, let's see if it's... Oh, physics, and then if there's something with mass. Yes, there's also mass. So if we go to well, get stuck here to replicator core physics, then you can actually see which functions are supported. So collider, rigid body, and then you have the velocities, uh, the recitation offset, the contact offset, um, and there's also a mass. So you can then change mass density, center of mass, inertia, and so on. I think the best also to check this if one doesn't really want to check in the API, there should be API documentation here. So let's see physics. I don't know. Ah, here. And then here you can find all the modules. Okay, so there's a question. How can we simulate different types of cameras, lenses? So cameras also have whatever you can do in isaac sim you can also change it here so if we look at camera okay there we go so focal length focus distance f-stop horizontal aperture so all the properties that um, omniverse or isaac sim supports they're also wrapped into replicator so this you can do this also in creating a camera through replicator but you can also use an existing camera and then wrap that into a node and use that for generating the render product so it doesn't really matter what's important that it's a camera okay let me check if there are any 
questions. Okay, with the LiDAR, is it possible to map semantic IDs from LiDAR to objects? So I am not sure about that. Um, might make sense to ask it on the forum, and I'll try to ping then the right people who might know. And to control the robot, I think so. Um, so you can definitely simulate LiDAR in the simulation. I don't know if you can get the annotated data from that. Uh, at least not straightforward for directly from an annotator. You can definitely get it, but I'm not sure what's the best way to do that. Okay, simulated sensors for 360 depth sensing. Um, so when, not sure if the point cloud can give can be given a field of view of 360, because then normally that should give you the depth. Uh, let me go to point cloud. Well, I, I think so, because you attach it on a render product, which is attached on a camera, and then you can probably set the camera to have a field of view of 360. Uh, I haven't tested it, though, so maybe it's might worth testing. And if it doesn't work, please just uh, write a forum question and maybe ping me, and I'll try to uh, ask the right person to see if there's a workaround or is there's another annotator for that. Okay, there's one that most of the examples are using indoor environments. What to use if they're for outdoor? So it doesn't really change anything. Um, it's however you set up your stage. Replicator per se doesn't really care. Uh, yes, but you need to be aware how you set up your lighting and so on, the, the, the artistic side of it. Um, yes, and then probably the sky is going to be a dome and then however you label that it might appear as only one thing as sky or if you have to want to have clouds and so on and so forth then you have to go into the details of actually either mapping those on materials i guess or adding prims um yes So using replicator on trees, uh, I think there's also a lot of examples with trees. Um, in Isaac, so let me start it. So yes, it's that shouldn't be a limitation. If we have slam built in, I do not know on top of my head. It, the best would be to look over the. Isaac Sim tutorials. Uh, there might be a, an example, maybe something built in. Uh, involving water. Um, well, there's liquid simulation, but I don't know. You can uh, you cannot probably not simulate the whole ocean. So for like small scenarios you can have physics based water otherwise you one will just use all the tricks that they use in gaming so um it's just gonna be like rendered nicely but doesn't necessarily use physics to to move things so you would have like specific functions that are moving that uh i'm not sure what's how one labels that right now so if you want to label specific things uh, it might be harder but if it's just one prim or one material on the water, I think that's going to be labeled fine. I haven't tested that. Okay, let's see if I... Maybe samples. 
if it loads. So here you can look at samples and then you can choose different type of um, assets. Otherwise you can just load in your own assets. Um, top line, simulation. Yes, yeah, so I think there should be enough samples. Yes, otherwise just you can bring in your own um, existing scenarios. Yes, for recognizing a boat in the water, I think I, I don't think that's an issue. I mean, you can just randomly place the boat and then have the water as a background. You can also have the water as a, a dome. So you can also have a, a light to the dome light, which is then just a, a large sphere, and then you can add various materials on it. Um, you can see an example with this. Uh, let me. In Isaac Sim, if you go into offline pose estimation, here we use the backgrounds are basically just this high definition textures applied on this dome light. So you can also just put a boat here and then have a lot of these images that are images with water. So this would be like a very easy way of getting started without simulating um, actual water. I don't think there's a limit how large a scene can be. It can also be 100 miles, I guess. Um, it will will probably require better hardware, but I doubt that it's a limit. Okay, so I guess this would be it from my side. Any last questions? Otherwise, I guess we can end the stream and uh, yeah, feel free to post any other future questions on the forum and we'll try to answer as many as we get the chance to. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a nice evening and morning or afternoon. Okay, bye-bye.